All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 45 on the mark, I'd like to be on time. My name is uh, Hassan Al-Waitam. I'm from Toronto, Canada. I don't have a slide about me, so I'll just use this as a background slide. Uh, I'm a electrical engineer by training. Never worked in it, because who would? Uh, <clears throat> I learned, uh, I ended up going into marketing by mistake. I met a friend, someone he led me into digital marketing, and six years later, here I am talking about Google Analytics. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I work at Bounteous. Bounteous is a co-innovation uh, digital transformation company. We help our clients uh, just be, be more digital, more digitally focused. We build, help them build apps and build their websites. And we use Drupal uh, for a, a lot of a lot of our clients' websites. So I'm going to start this off with a bit of history because it's a fun topic. So just Google Analytics as and it is. It started back in 2005, where Google, uh, where it was called Urchin back then. Uh, a little fun fact: there is a term UTM source, UTM medium, in terms of t to where the traffic sources come online. UTM stands for Urchin Tracking Module, and the term just stuck up until today. So Urchin was acquired by Google back in 2005. Uh, it got rebranded to Google Analytics in 2007, and. Back then, there was apps weren't so popular. It was still relatively new. Uh, this is right before or right around the time when Steve Jobs got on stage and introduced the concept of mobile apps. Uh, so Google Analytics kind of like took its time to adapt to apps. So back until it wasn't until 2012 where it launched a SDK to track uh, uh, mobile apps, and, and it was a problem because Google Analytics was more focused towards web. So web interactions, kind of the thought process behind web interactions is very different how app interaction would, would happen. So there's always this kind of, they're not cohesive. And because it was a different SDK and a different kind of tracking model, they ended up splitting up being, becoming Firebase Analytics. So apps was Firebase Analytics, web was Universal Analytics. They both were under the Google Analytics run, but they, if someone had a, web, a website and an app, it, you'd, they track in two different places. Uh, back then, also, uh, there was the Cambridge Analytica that kind of news broke out, and then a lot, all of issues with data privacy started coming out, and then the uh, EU kind of dropped the GDPR thing and, and concept and kind of ruined the dreams of the perfect marketing world, where we can collect all information on everyone and know what your grandmother likes to have for lunch. Yeah, that's that's not true, but we can. Uh, so GDPR got accepted back in uh, 2016, and that posed a problem for Universal Analytics because it utilized a lot of third-party cookies. And it utilized, so companies weren't ready to kind of adopt this just on set. So it was a process to get, get to, to a place. The solution back then by Google Analytics was kind of rebranding uh, Firebase into Google Analytics for apps. Basically, they did nothing other than change the name and said, it works. Fun fact, even at 2017 is when I went in the field and started learning more about Google Analytics and understanding how it works. So what we didn't know back then uh, was Google in the background was developing this new thing called web and app tracking. We didn't know what it was. It wasn't uh, available for public. But at, at the time, uh, Safari came up with the ITP 2.0, which kind of just stopped everything in its tracks. For, if you're not aware, ITP, uh, I don't know what it stands for, but I know it, it just stops you from tracking people after seven days on Safari. So good luck. If, you're, if the tr um, conversion funnel is longer than two a week, you're, you're out of luck. You have to start over every single time. This worked well for e-commerce. It was fine for e-commerce, but for B2B and bigger, bigger purchases where people would need up to three, a mo uh, three weeks or a month to kind of convert, that would pose a big problem. Uh, for, for especially for analytics. In 2020, uh, GA4 was dropped for the public, and it was rebranded to G Google Analytics 4. Why 4? No one knows because there was no 3 or 2 or 1. It was just, it's like the Windows 7, 8, and then 10. Uh, so Google Analytics 4 launched, and it kind of changed everything in terms of how it's tracked, and I'll explain what, it, what I mean by it changed everything, because the thought process, it unified both web and app, and the experience of tracking kind of got unified. 
So it's a whole new model of thinking of how you tr we track interactions on websites. Uh, now, the biggest news to come out was that Universal Analytics will be sunsetted in July 1st of 2023. So counting today, we have 66 days left to tra transfer from Universal Analytics to GA4. I'm hoping everyone who, uh, who works on a website already tra uh, transferred just for the uh, year, year over year tracking, but you have 66, 66 days left, so hopefully there's some time. So the main question is what changed? Why the big shift from Universal to GA4? And the answer is the data model. The data model in Universal Analytics kind of focused on one main thing, the user. And then it bucketed all the user interaction into sessions. So once the website loads, it's called a session starts. So on everything in, uh, that the user does on that, uh, during that time is called a hit. So a session starts, I open a page, it's a page you hit. I scroll, I click on an, any element, on a button, uh, or I click on a form, that's all under event hit. So it's a page you hit, and then everything else is an event hit. And then if I close the page and come back the next day, a new session starts, another page view event, uh, hit will, will be sent, and then another event hit will be sent. Whereas in GA4, all this goes away. It's all still focused on the user, but it's everything is event-based. So it kind of fits well with apps, since everything on, every interaction on an app is an event, and if there's no concept of page use on an app, because it's a, it's a screen view, you could say. So the concept of page view kind of, a page view hit kind of went away, so they had to unify this, everything became an event, even a session. <laughs> so once the page loads, or a, a, a screen on the app loads, a session event would, would start, indicating that this is the start of a session. There will be some a session ID that connects all those events together. So in the back end, GA4 kind of says, oh, I know this event is back, traced back to this session. This first time user that came to visit my site has a first a visit event, it connects to the session. They view the page or view the screen. It, connects, it all connects in one session because of a unique session ID. Now I close, let's say I close the page and then visit the next day. It comes with another string, a new session start event, which is separate from the first one, and encompasses all those events they string together in, in a series, so that in the back end, Google Analytics connects it all to a session, kind of calculates it how long the session was, and does similar calculations, but the concept, instead of being a session based, and starts accounting for a session, everything encompasses under the session, it's in a series of events that shows you the path, okay, they started with this, and then this, and then this, which kind of fits well with tracking on web still works, but also fits better when it's tracking an app, especially in a world where apps are king. The other thing that changed is how an event is structured. Now, in uh, Universal Analytics, an event was very structured, and like, you have only those three or four things that you have to fill out. It's all under fit under a category, a type, a category of event, and then you have the action, the label, and a value. A value would be something if I scroll, how, how much do I scroll? The percentage scroll, 10%, 20%, 30. It's all fit under value. What page did I scroll on? Something I would want to make up to fill out the label, the label section. So it was, it was very rigid, and I had to fit the event into this structure. Google Analytics 4 said, well, this is too rigid. We need to make it easier for users to create an event, and the event should be more easily understandable just by the name. So they put in something called event label and then parameters. Now, parameters uh, work similar to action label and value, but they give a lot more depth to that event. So let's say uh, you had a button on a website or an app and you wanted to measure how many people clicked on that button. So you'd say, okay, this click, uh, this is an X button click. Uh, the parameters here are, I would say, what time of day, how this was fired, what page it was buttoned on, what is button on, uh, the type of user, are they locked in, locked out. There's a, it gives a lot more depth to what happened with that event. So you can build a story just from that, the parameters you can send in with an event. This is where it kind of opens up what you can track and what you can understand from each interaction, each event happening. So I'm going to show you just a, a live demo, but in general, uh, let's just go in. Uh, I'm not, you know what, I'm going to show a quick overview of Google Analytics. So on the homepage, it just gives you a quick snapshot of number of users, 
how many events were fired, if there's any conversions, and how many user, users came in. And new users is also an event. I just showed the first visit or first open for an app is how Google Analytics identifies this as a new user. So when they come back again, it just says, oh, this, this person already came in, so there's, it's, not a, it's a returning user. So it measures everything differently there. And you can see it's 19,000 users, 15K are new. Uh, uh, it gives you suggestions based off of how you use Google Analytics on what you'd like to see. Like for me, I care more about where traffic is coming from, so it shows me this, which country, countries in the world, and just a set of event counts. The main thing here is events, and under reports you'll find events, all the events that are coming in. And to show you, showcase what those parameters do. So we know that there's a view promotion event, so people are seeing a promotion on the site. But which promotion are they seeing? Uh, what pages are they seeing this promotion on? We can click on it, and it gives me a lot more depth and detail about this event. So it tells me where in the world are the users uh, when this event happens. Are they male or female? Uh, how many times do those events fire per session? So if I, do they see it just once, or do they see it five or six times? So roughly 5.3 times. Uh, the page title, the title of the page uh, where this event is firing. Uh, the location as in the URL. Uh, if, if there's a payment type, because it's a few promotion and they're using specific type of payments, so they, we can see all this information. Now I'm using Google's demo account, so you will see a lot of not set, but it's the concept, it gives a proper understanding of the concepts of the type of information you can share within that specific event. And you can track, uh, track all this depending on your analytics, analytical needs. Do you have to set up those variables independently or does Google give those to you out of the box? You have to set it all up. I don't know. Sweet. Yes. So there, there are some that are recommended by Google that you set up, and they will tell you, set those up, please. And there is others that are custom that you can do whatever you want. Out of, and this is all customizable. You can let your imagination run wild. Of course, within limit, because we still have GTBAR to worry about, and Castle in Canada. I'm not sure about the States. If they even care about data privacy, I know the <laughs> California does. <laughs> we have to tend to care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So you, it, it is fully customizable. There are a set of events, especially for e-commerce. There are a set of recommended events that Google says, please set them up because Google, first and foremost, built this for e-commerce. But uh, you can play around with it and customize it in a way where you can track a SaaS product all through Google Analytics. It takes a little finessing, but it, it does work. Uh, yeah, so it gives you, basically there's a lot of more information that you can send in to an event outside of just the action, uh, category action label and value structure that you had in Universal Analytics, which is great. The other thing that GA4 introduced, and this is way before the G chat GPT and all the fun AI talk, is machine learning in GA4. This was the crux of why Google said we wanted to create a new thing because this is a feature that required an overhaul of the back end of Google Analytics. What now you can do is, so I talked about suggestions of based on my activity. This is basically learning how I use Google Analytics and suggests those cards because it knows, oh, you're a marketer, so you care about where the traffic is coming from or uh, where, what countries are, are the users in. But if someone was more on the technical side, it might, they, they might see something different different cards, and it's, all, it's basically just the machine learning aspect, learning of how you're utilizing or using J4. Other, another thing you can, you can learn is just automated insights, where it, it just learns from your data and tells you right off the bat, oh, we noticed there's something happening here that's worth your look. Uh, and you can customize it too, basically saying, I want to track this specific metric to see if it increases or decreases by a set percentage. And to show you this here, there is insights and recommendations. So in this section, you'll see this is all the automated insights. It's telling me that the organic channel drove 33% more revenue than the, than the rest. For me, as an analyst, I would have to go in and check every channel to figure find that, find this out. But Google Analytics 4 just talked about told me, OK, here's, here's your job done for you. I'm not going to be replaced yet, I, I hope. Uh, and also it shows you other, uh, other information like the revenue last week versus this week. There's certain uh, insights that someone would want to go in and dig deeper. Just knowing where to start because of this machine learning aspect is a really nifty feature. 
Another thing that they have is just they added more predictive metrics. So this is auto-calculated by Google. It's already pre-set up. Just you need to set up the recommended events like e-commerce, uh, add to cart, uh, checkout, and begin checkout, all those fun recommended events. Based off of those events, uh, the machine learning aspect can tell you, is there a probability of purchase? And if th this specific user set have a higher probability of purchase or lower probability of purchase. Uh, churn. Uh, churn means that they're like they're users who buy your product but may end up stopping and leave, leave, leaving. Stop, stop. They will stop buying your product. So churn, it predict, okay, this subset of users may end up churning in the next week or 60 days or so on. So it's a good nifty metric to kind of understand and can create audiences for marketing use to kind of remarket, bring them back in, entice them with the promotion and so on. This takes a lot of uh, crunching of numbers to kind of figure out, and GA4 does just that as it in like two minutes. Uh, and also predict revenue. So it's, let's say based off of your current trend, we expect that you will make a million dollars next month. Maybe. Uh, so it's, it's, re it's really good in terms of you don't have to export the data and kind of utilize it in another tool. It's all done, with un done automatically by GA4 with those kind of predictive metrics. And the last thing is if you're building charts and graphs to showcase to stakeholders, it'll show you in automatically in those charts or in a time series, uh, time series chart where the anomalies are. Like we were expecting uh, this metric to have this number, let's say the, we're expecting revenue to be at 100K, but for some reason it dipped to 50. It'll show you that anomaly explaining, okay, this is what we saw, uh, this is what the, the kind of traffic that we were seeing and this is what happened. Or if there's an influx, it'll show you, okay, there was an influx, something happened here. It, it just gives you the entry point for you to start your analytical process rather than discovering this yourself and kind of figuring out where to start to analyze. So this is a lot of the kind of main thoughts behind uh, why Google went this, the route of rebranding. But we are in a Drupal conference, and we're mostly a developer crowd, I'm assuming, developers? Yeah. So I do want to make it more re relevant. So one thing, as an analyst, uh, I help developers do is analyze how the website is doing. Not by the number of users coming in or uh, how many people clicked on this button, but one of the things that I, we used to face a lot back when I was in-house marketing was why is our website slow? Or why is some pages slow but some aren't? And what is causing the slowness? So I, like any, anyone would, I jumped into Google Speed Insights, plugged in the website, uh, your website URL there, and it told me, oh, you're doing well. But I'm still getting reports, no, there's slow pages. There's, so I tried to figure, figure out what, what, what the issue was, and then I discovered Core Web Vitals. And it's much easier to kind of analyze with GA4 and kind of shows the power of GA4 and what you can do with GA4. So Core Web Vitals are just a set of performance metrics that tells you how your website is doing. Google tracks this on a high level with Page Insights, uh, their Page Insights uh, speed test. And it focuses on something called CLS, LCP, and FID. I'll explain what those mean in a second, but those are the key three metrics that we look at to kind of analyze is the page load fast, slow, how important, uh, what should be fixed to kind of improve the speed. So uh, it was this Google Web Vitals was developed by Google. It's a library that can be added to the web, any website. Uh, and it's essential for if you want to improve your SEO rankings, uh, if marketers are saying we're ranking too low, just throw in this and tell them, okay, because of your pop-up, the website is slow, so blame them. As a, as a previous marketer, I'm giving you trips to take tips to kind of avoid marketing requests. Anyway, so the main, main three metrics, CLS, LC, uh, LCP, and FID. So Google created this library. They have all of this, on, uh, all the code on how documentation on GitHub. I don't want to go through it too much, but this is the main thing to get the library loaded. I, the slides are on the session page, so if you want to download them as a PDF and follow through, the link links to the GitHub, or if you want to scan the RQR code and just go through it yourself to your phone, feel free. So there's different ways where you can load in the library. I opted for this one because I use Google Tag Manager and won't accept anything other than standard JavaScript. Not even ES6, just this. Uh, the main concept of what this is doing is it's loading the, li the library and API, and then console logging CLS, FID, and 
Okay. LCP. That's basically what it's doing. There's nothing too complicated. You can play around with it to do something else, but those are this is in the end, this is what's gonna do. Log <laughs> what the metrics for S, uh, CLS, FID, and LCP. Set them too much. Now let's go into what they mean. CLS is the most complicated one, and even I don't understand what, what the point of the is. But basically, it stands for cumulative layout shift. In a nutshell, if you have an element that moves on the, on the page, that can conceive, give the user an experience that, OK, this is, the site is still loading, or it's not fully loaded. So knowing what is moving on the page, what elements are moving based because of a CSS function, or, or a JavaScript function, or something. And, and knowing where it is, and knowing how much is it moving, is important to kind of improve usability. And it's not, not so that the website uh, uh, loads slowly. It's more a percep perception that the user sees that, OK, because this is moving or it's not fully loaded yet, it seems like the website is low. A good score should be under 100. Because Google is so smart, they never told us what 100 represents. Milliseconds, mm -hmm. pixels, just 100. So, we're just going with what the Google said, under 100. Now, in the previous slide, I showed you that it, uh, the function console logs uh, CLS, on, on CLS console.log. So what that does, it returns a JSON object with all the information. And here is what it looks like. It means nothing. But there are specific points that is important to kind of take a note of. First of all, the name, of course. We know what the name is, but also the value. This is an amazing number to hit. It's way over, uh, under 100, so perfect. Uh, another thing to kind of look at, look at is what is the element and how did it move? So it gives you where it was initially and where it is right now. How much did it move? According to this example, it did not move by much. It just went down a couple of pixels or up a couple of pixels but nothing too major. But also it gives you the ID, or the, in this case, the class of the element uh, which that, uh, that is moving. And it's important to know, because then when you're analyzing what is going wrong, if let's say this was 200 something, then OK, I need to know what this element is that's moving, and kind of figure out why it's moving, and how can I improve on this metric. Maybe lower, lower how much it moves, and so on. So in a nutshell, that is CLS. Another thing we're talking about is the larger content payful. And usually that, when on home pages, it's the hero image. It's basically the biggest element of the page that is, lo that is loading. And here we're talking about we want to make sure that it loads as fast as possible. Because the slower this loads, even if the rest of the page is uh, fully loaded, but this is still loading, it shows a perception to the user that the page is too slow. So. This is also why this is why it's very important because it's more perception rather than actually it's slowly loading slowly. Uh, the best score should be anything under 2.5 seconds, and at least they gave us what 2.5 means stands for this time. Seconds. The problem is that when you look at the code of the, uh, of the JSON object, it shows you 786. Yet the rating is good because this is milliseconds. No idea why Google does this. They love to kind of <laughs> create drama and suspense. Anyway, but here you show, you see that it gives you the value. And it does the same thing. It gives you the element uh, class, or classes in this case. And also, if it's an image or a video, it gives you the URL that you should be worried about. In this case, I'm not using a CDN, so maybe that's the start to fix. Uh, so it, those are the kind of information that you can expect from the return and kind of make, make note of and kind of start collecting in GA4. Lastly is the first input delay. And this is also another perception more than it is something that slows the website. It's when the user s starts the first input and the response they get back from uh, the front end. So if I scroll, if it takes a more than 100 milliseconds for it to scroll down. So I, I scroll on my wheel because I live in the 90s. And then uh, it takes a, a while for the page to actually move down. That gives me the perception that the website is too slow to respond, it's too slow to load. So having a, something as under 100 milliseconds is perfect because it doesn't. it's too fast for the user to see that something is slow or fast and so on. 
And this is the response, uh, the JSON response that you might expect. The value that it's three milliseconds, so that's perfect. It's what type of interaction that happened, and also oh wait no, yeah that's it. That's it because it's an interaction. So it's just the value and the name of the interaction. So far, I haven't had any trouble with this, so I don't know how, if there's any issues, how to fix this, which is weird. I haven't heard any, anyone have any troubles with this before, so maybe that's a good sign. But it's important to keep track of, nevertheless. Where is this being output? So, based off of the co original code. Yeah. Which you loaded in Tag Manager. Yeah, loaded in Tag Manager. It's console.log. Console now, I will do a live demo on oh, how. Oh, in the console. Okay. Yeah. Yes, good. Uh, I will do a, a live demo on how you can kind of push it into a Tag Manager and kind of utilize it. But basically, now for now, it's just on the console. Uh, everything is being printed in the console. All right. All right. Now we want to connect this to GA4. Now, uh, we start off with using this Tag Manager model from Drupal. I'm trying to keep it very relevant. I hope it's working. Uh, so based off of just using this module, you can just input, and here I'll show you what you need to do. Uh, oh, yeah, did this. Okay, just put in the tag manager ID and you're fully connected. That's all you need to do. Now, I put it preloaded everything. So first off, we need uh, to load the uh, core web vitals library. So what I did is, is this clear enough or should I zoom? So what I did, the different, the different thing from what the original code is I put in the function data layer dot push. Now data layer is just a lab, an array of objects, JSON objects, and just has a lot of information that the web, your website has. For Drupal, you can send in stuff like information about the author of the, of the page or the type of content of the page and so on. It's, it, all this can be sent to Google Analytics for further analysis, but in this specific case, we're just focusing on the CLS, FID, and LCP. And then, based off of the, the return objects, I created a couple of uh, variables in Tag Manager, where this, uh, this is just captures a value, a blanket state value for all LCP, FID, and uh, LC, uh, CLS. And then, for the node, it requires a bit of finesse, and you have to go into uh, select the object and then it's an array so you have to choose the first one and the way GTM works it doesn't accept the brackets it has to be dots because it's weird uh, so dot source dot zero dot node this is how you get at least the element of it and then uh, we did the value and for funsies I captured the ID just to separate myself because I like collecting data I just add more information to send them and I'm gonna showcase this how it works exactly so when I click on preview, and to my own personal blog that is empty, first we can look at the data layer here that didn't load. There we go. We got the FID. Uh, we got the value of 18. We got the if in the entries we have its first input. Because mm, key down, okay. So press press the button. So that's the first input. It's not the most user friendly way. So there is another way in the tag <coughs> assistant. It shows you all the messages coming in to the data layer. So we can see this one was actually an FID, and then there's another message, LCP. And if we look at the variables that I created, it didn't capture the node. Fun. But it did capture the value, and there should be a, there it is, the ID. And basically, this is how it captures the information based off of what's in the data layer and how I set up the, uh, the variables. It captures them in this long list, laundry list of variables. And now I can utilize this to build an event, build an event, and send it to GA4. Uh, let's build it together because I. So as we said, you just, no, this is a configuration. Uh, we can call this, because 
of the structure I mentioned, we can have event name and then parameters under it. So the event name for this would be uh, Drupal. And we have the event, event parameters. So now this is just an example of how we can build event parameters. We have the ID, the node, and the value of uh, those events. And also we want to know the name of this specific event. So we can build events for each and every single one, the LCP, FID, and uh, CLS. So for now, I'm just going to say ID. Uh, ID. Also, J4 prefers snake case. So if anyone ha prefers camel case, I'm sorry. Let's stick to snake case. I know this is a touchy topic. <laughs> And then we can add for value. Now for the trigger, I'll just put all pages for now. Uh, I don't want to go too deep on how to trigger the event and how G G uh, Tag Manager works. But this is basically how we build the event and how the events are structured in J4. Once those events are fired, they come into, I'm going to go into another, okay. they, they start showing up on the list uh, here. I, when, I, when I created this uh, demo, I named it as CLS, LCP, and FID to track all, each one separately. And each one has their own parameters of value and like, the IDs and the values coming in. Now this is all well and good. We collected the values. We have everything stored in GA4. Now we want to understand what's happening. So we need to analyze the data. Can we just call you at that point? Yes. Uh, <laughs> another way. <laughs> so there is this dashboard that I built. You can scan the code and you can copy it yourself and kind of connect the data once you have everything set up. You can co uh, copy this dashboard and just connect it to your Google Analytics. It's all ready. This is kind of a freebie that I want to share with you. And I'm going to show you how it works. So here is. Let's put it in right. So what it, what it, the dashboard shows is that what are the three metrics that we're looking at, and based off of like the okay, good, and bad of them, what the metrics are. Anything lower than 100 is good. Anything between 100 and 250 is OK. And anything above 250 is bad and needs to be fixed right now. And the same thing for LCP and FID. Now, I started with looking at averages of overall what the metrics are. And then the next part would be, uh, or the next part would be an individual page. What is the metric for each individual one? And the, the similar color scheme, green, yellow, or red, so that you know, okay, this is good, okay, and bad. For now, let's say we're looking at homepages LCP is horrible. So this needs immediate fixing. So as we said, LCP is the largest, largest content paintful. So it is important to kind of know what, what elements of this page need to be fixed. So here we go into, we're checking issues. The LCP for the homepage comes from this specific element, the in, in, intro header. And this is the URL for this image. It's causing the, the problem for the homepage. We do have another one for sign up that's causing issues. So those are like the first two steps to kind of fix LCP for those two, two pages. And then you're back on point. Same thing, we can look at the same thing for the CLS, the content shift. We are seeing which elements are, uh, are moving around on the page a lot. And then FIDs, what are, where, which pages the FIDs are slow? And if there's any, what are the interactions and so on? I know kind of ran through this quickly, but I did want to leave a lot of time for questions because I have a feeling that it will be. Yeah. <laughs> right. yes. So how much emphasis do you think that Google is putting on those three metrics? Like what's, if you had to like say, like is it is a part of you know your search engine rankings and how well your site's performing, et cetera, like how much emphasis are they putting on them? So basically all the emphasis is on them. Uh, when it comes to speed, so for search, for search engine optimization, so it's a topic on its own, it's a yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but when it comes when they say site speed should be this, 
it's basically referencing one of those three metrics. Mostly LCP, the largest content painful, because it's the easiest fix, and it's the biggest issue where, where like users actually see this. The others, I've talked to users uh, talking when we fixed an CLS on FID, and they were like, yeah, I didn't notice that change. But the LCP, because it, you see it loading, it's very important for them. Uh, and I've seen this, it affects your ranking on Google. On Bing and other such engines, I'm not sure how well, it, 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 how, how much of a change it does because they focus more on keywords and the type of content and so on. But for site speed, Google definitely wants you to improve that uh, speed. Okay. And I have one other really high level question. So in this, um, I don't know if it's worth mentioning the way that the G4 is collecting data because it's very different than UA. So it's collecting data in, in three or four different ways depending on how you set it up signed in Google users, the, all of the data that they used to collect as far as the fact that you can't see it says, you know, unknown, um, you know, that's the reason why they're collecting data differently now is, is because they can't know a lot of that because of these the issues that, you know, what people say, opting out of collecting data, right? Yeah. So there's all these reasons why, that also the ways that they're collecting data is different now. Um, so I guess, you know, given that that question, my next question is, is, is there another analytics platform that people are using now? We've all been using Google Analytics for the last 15, 20 years. Um, you know, are, are people looking at other platforms? From the clients I've worked with, very few. So mostly what I've seen is that Google still holds a big chunk of the, the, the market. But there are other uh, platforms popping up, mainly used in Europe, uh, for GDPR reasons. So there is there is uh, a platform called Quick Pro, where it basically it does not do session based tracking. It it hashes a user ID and then deletes it when when the, when the user uh, signs off. So every time a new user com uh, a new user comes in, it's a new user with a different unique uh, and a hashed ID. And according to GDPR, as, as long as that is not saved anywhere, you're fine. So there is those types of platforms coming in with more privacy focus. The, the reason why people still opt in for Google Analytics, and I don't see them leaving Google Analytics, is because of the connections with uh, like Google Ads or Ads platforms, and, uh, or, or mostly remarketing and marketing tools. <coughs> because of how easy it is to kind of connect Google Analytics to Google Ads, or Google uh, 360 display and, and display video. All this makes, it e makes the user want to use GA4 because it's just easier rather than figuring out how to collect this data, export it, import it into those uh, ad, ads tools and so on. Uh, also now Salesforce is jumping on the mix. There's a lot of integrations between Salesforce and uh, uh, Google Analytics and a lot of the enterprises use Salesforce heavily so they, it's easy to connect Salesforce data with Google Analytics data and do their customization and their personalized marketing and stuff. Yes. Uh, let's start with you. <laughs> Okay. Great job, by the way. Um, I was always a Lighthouse fan uh, to inspect some of those uh, values. And then just getting hip recently to page speed insights. And I understand the difference was where Lighthouse is lab only data in perfect conditions yes. that they've set. Um, page speed insights is a combination of the lab and the real world uh, Chrome user data. Mm -hmm. And so the values are different in that way, but I like the way that PageSpeed Insights reports it. When you were showing those values, something I didn't understand, and then they found in another Google blog was under Chrome Developer Tools was the Chrome UX Crux yeah. report, which is a lot like PageSpeed Insights. Yes, that's this is all based on the Crux. Crux, yeah. I thought so, because what you're not showing is that different experience between mobile and desktop. Yes. As Page Speed Insights breaks it down between those two, and you can get very different scores. Mm -hmm. Something that's red on mobile but not desktop, of yeah. course. So, so I don't want to jump too deep into this topic, but yeah. based off of exactly the parameters you can send in with with the events, and also this is automatically done by Google, like telling you this is desktop, tablet, or mobile. Yeah, you can split this data into three different and all I'm three. Sure you can. So yeah. you can see if it's. Mostly, your focus. Of course, this is all web experience. Uh -huh. So, if you, you can basically say, okay, this is the mob. I want to focus on all mobiles and type, types of mobile devices, 
maybe a Samsung Galaxy S4 back from back in way back in the day loads the site in a different different speed and, and different a different kind of different values come in, and that's why there's an increase in FID or increase in LCP. Uh, it's spiking because this specific device people are a lot to sign into the website and yeah, it's causing all this. So. There is a lot of ways you can kind of dice and, uh, slice and dice the information to kind of get dig deeper. And the difference between this and Lighthouse or uh, PageSuite Insights is that it's per user, per page information. And it's like the rawest of raw data. Whereas PageSuite Insights and Lighthouse, Lighthouse, as you said, perfect conditions, and it just combines all this information and averages out for you. And maybe breaks it, it does break it down per page, but it's just an average of perfect conditions, this is what you can, should expect. Mm -hmm. The same thing with page insights, insights, where it looks through all the pages on the site, gives you an average, and says, okay, this is the average total, and this is a problem page. But with this, you have you have access to the raw data, so there's a lot more information you can do, and kind of like, a lot more insights you can like, grab out of it. It's because also historical. It's also back. historical, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so when you see combined scores like that, is that just taking the average between it is. All devices. Yeah, 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 it is. And we can build filters to kind of like break it down based sure. on the device. But for the purposes of this presentation, and I only had an hour, so I couldn't like go <laughs> deep. But we can break it that breaks down into like per user. Level. Yeah, we use the crux thing for that. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's. Yes, you're standing. So. Huh. I'm a developer, and uh, the GA tool is owned by the marketing team. As a developer, one is how do I know if I'm using <laughs> One, two is how do I tell them to use GA4? Oh, if they're not using GA4, I would go to leadership, leadership and tell them to fire them. They're doing something <laughs> wrong. Marketing, GA4 is, Google Analytics is important overall. And if they're not using GA4, they're going to be lose, losing data. So I would start off with the f first slide of the timeline, telling them July 1st is the deadline. Use GA4 now. That's number how one. Do how do you know? Yeah. I'll show you something. Quickly. Ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this, uh, it's called Google Tag Assistant Legacy. If I enable it and load the page, it tells you all the tags that are on the site. And if you find anything called global site tag or gtag.js, that means you're using J4. No, that's how, that's how you know. And if they don't use it, just call me up. Here's my. You have my LinkedIn. Call me up. I'll I'll talk to them for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you check in with developers to verify and fix things? Like, are you a part of that conversation, or are you? Um, like, how often would you recommend us developers to look at these and so hand off? It depends on how complex the site is and how complex the analytical process, or like the analytical information that we need is. There are times where I don't talk to developers at all because I can do everything through Tag Manager. So all I need from the developer is just input this code snippet and we're good. But when it comes to, there are other parts. I worked with a client where I had to basically become the developer. Uh, I would build a whole documentation of, okay, put this code, snippet code, send this function, on this click, on that click. This is the information that I need. And we would check in on a regular basis because everything needed to be done through the developers. And it felt like I didn't want to overwhelm them by do, letting them to do all the research. So we worked together, like, OK, this is what I found. Does this fit the code base that you're trying to do? How can we improve this or clean up the code? And there was a lot of back and forth and kind of uh, collaboration there. Of course, that was an expense of client hours, so I would not definitely recommend that. But it's important to have that conversation, at least have a, a good inf um, information meeting in the get-go, setting the expectations, under understanding what the marketing needs or the analytics people needs. I feel like there's always that disconnect because we have a, a, like a, an initial point, okay, yeah, this is the, uh, we, we kicked off the, the project, we know what needs to be done, then we go, and then we find out, okay, this is not detailed enough or Developers didn't ask ask the right questions, or analytics didn't give us give any information. I know we do, so I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so having that in a long long meeting in the, in the get go, just understanding all the requirements, who helps with at least helps define how many meetings do you have on how on what kind of basis do you, you need to meet with the develop, developers meet meet with the marketing team or analytics team. Yes. Just to 
instead of build on what that gentleman was saying about how he would tell what the site is using, do you, what, can you do that through inspecting? Yes, you can. So it is a bit more, I don't like it, but there is a way. Uh, so if we go to, uh, most of what I do is on Chrome, but I think it can translate over to Firefox and uh, Opera. But if we go to network, I'm just going to reload this. And it just shows everything. I already have this filtered, so it's great. Anything with collect, here, let me see if this, is, no, it won't zoom this one. So anything with collect and v equals two, this is basically the uh, the API call that the the browser sends to J4. So you can see it's a collect and, and the version two, which is J4, and then you can see the uh, with the oh, the second one TID, the ID of the uh, uh, the Google Analytics property the G dash E or something. This is how you can see all the API call that was sent from the web from the browser to GA4. Is there anything you can find within like um, uh, like within the header code? Like uh, maybe you know how in like UA there was there's a GTM equals UA or something. Yeah. Like that? So there is, but it depends on how Google Analytics was set up. Okay. So you can find here, for example, I don't have, uh, I have Google Analytics set up through Tag Manager. So I do find this script saying that Google Tag Manager is there, but that doesn't tell you if J4 is installed through Tag Manager or not. There are times where, um, as, you, as you said, there is, uh, there's a snippet of code built in the head uh, element that tells you, okay, this is connecting to uh, Universal or J J4. Yeah, the easiest thing is that the Tag Manager Assistant. It's like just a, something you add to your browser. It takes just a couple of seconds to do it. Uh, I'm interested to see if that's available on Firefox. It is. Oh, it's a good question. Uh, it is. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's easy to do. If you have access to their tag manager, you can see that immediately. And then it's right. not your responsibility. As a developer, like somebody should be able to log into their tag manager and see that there's a change. It's more of like a, from like an upsell point of view. Do yeah. yeah. you have GA4 installed? Yeah. Let me, I can see that you don't. I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I apologize if I missed it. I got it here late, which is not cool. But does uh, you said in your first slide that you talked about a timeline? Are they are they migrating users to GA4 automatically? I saw at some point that they said they'd set up a GA4 property for you. Yes. It was bad. It was the reception Do you remember was bad. That yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like wait, we're So the whole point was and I'll show you, I can show you an example of this. Okay. Uh, the whole point was <coughs> this is my empty universal analytics property. Okay. And a lot of people did actually uh, kind of already migrate. But the problem was there's a specific setting in admin here uh, actually sorry it's in admin here oh they moved it or ah. no no that uh, here it is yeah the, this should say connected so even if you migrated and but you do not gonna connect this you got a message saying we will migrate for you uh, by migrate for you means we'll just create the property for you. Create the property for you. They, they didn't do Not anything. Validated. Yeah. So this is where like, why are you sending me this? I already created the GA4 property and migrated. Why are you telling me? It's because of this pesky little thing that a lot of people didn't notice. So that's basic. It, that's why the reception of this was really bad. And uh, Google kind of said, oh, but you can opt out if you want to. Mm -hmm. And then it was automatically already opted out unless you opt in for us to migrate. Because we, we host and maintain a lot of our client sites, and um, we oftentimes install Google or Analytics or GA4 now for ourselves more than the client tracking their own sales data or anything like that, just to have a site or web vitals and whatnot. Um, and we're trying to kind of like have a discussion of, okay, to migrate, you're not very interested in your own analytics, but we want them. but. We also want to get paid for the effort of going through and, and setting this up, and it shouldn't take long. But you know, you have to validate, and test, and yeah. 
hosting environments, whatnot. So uh, I wasn't sure how much of that was going to carry over um, after July. Um, do you have any advice or strategies for moving clients to GA4? Um, is it something that you think should even be charged to a client for upgrading them? We charge them already in, in yeah. mountains, so we can. But it, 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 does, it, it, does need, it does need a structure. Uh, so understanding how the measurement works in GA4 mm -hmm. may, can make it a bit easier how to migrate. So one thing we do is we analyze all the events of our clients, uh, or no, clients to universal analytics okay. and kind of say, okay, based off of what you're tracking, this is what we recommend the event structure should look like. Okay, this is the event name, those are parameters coming in, uh, some uh, sample values of what, might be, uh, what the event would, lo would look like uh, uh, fleshed out. And then we can start building that based off of what they already have. Like any triggers uh, in Tag Manager, we build off of that. If they use on-site code, we'll write the code for them and tell them, okay, tell your developers this is what they should put in place of Universal and kind of build, build from there. But it's something that clients do look for, and it does, especially if they use Universal Analytics to understand the value of it, yeah. they would definitely jump on board to kind of migrate. Can I just add to that really quick? So the very first step of setting this up takes 10 minutes. Yeah. So like, so I guess the way that we did it is we said, we're going to take 10 minutes and we're going to set this up for you. And then we're going to analyze it, just like you said, and tell you all the things you need to do and quote out for you the amount of time that it will take for us to do the rest of it. Migrate goals. Migrate goals, set up events, because there's yeah. a lot that, like, that was one of the big changes too with this was that they did it because like you said, it was very rigid, and they were telling everybody what was important to them instead of us saying, these are the, the analytics that are important to us, yeah. right? So we were able to say, you know, hey, here's we, we're doing this 10-minute task for you. That's how we did our upturn. We're just going to do this for you. <coughs> it takes 10 minutes for us to do this, and then we're going to say, hey, it takes five hours or 20 hours for us to do the rest of your events and goals. Yeah. And then whether or not they were in support or build, we would either say, like in the support side, we would say, like, hey, do you want to spend your hours this month on sure, this? Sure. And we'll set it up for you. Yeah, that's great. That's kind of how we handle that. Just to add to that, we're, I mean, we're operating under the assumption that everything in Google Tag Manager has to always have to be rebuilt for GA4. Is that not, not, not everything. Necessarily. Not necessarily. So, just as one of these, this example is only GA4, but one thing we do for clients is that they already have an event being sent based off of this specific trigger, like yeah. CE sign up. We just use the same trigger for a different, a different tag. So basically, we're just rebuilding that one tag and putting in the information. It's the same variables and the same triggers, it's just the tag that's sending to a different property that's different. So, it, so another way of restating that is the tags in general have to be developed. Yeah, that, that's basically, yeah. May, unless there's something completely different that you want to do for tracking, but other, if it's just migrating one like, event per event, then this is, this is basically you're just rebuilding the tag. Mm -hmm. So like the dashboard, right? Yeah. So for a few minutes, like we implement this, can you compare this data with like last year's data that's... Yes. Uh, where did it go? Oh. oh, I didn't put it in. But yes, you can. Uh, basically, there's. It's just a checkbox where you, where it shows you. Okay, a week ago or last year, it was this, and now it's this. You can see like has it improved? Not you no know, increased, decreased, better, worse, so on. So there is a lot you can do with those types of dashboards, and a lot of filtering that could be built in. Again, for the sake of sake of just presentation kind of get, getting the understanding concept of what it, how it can be used. It's very simplistic of what I did. Uh, but basically, it'll, there's a lot more you, you can do with this data because you have, you're collecting the raw, raw data of, this, of those vitals. So you're not depending on Google telling you what the data is or Lighthouse or so on and perfect conditions. This is real life data, real life raw data that's owned by you. So you can do everything you can. And it's does not fall under GDPR or any data privacy because anonymized, so you're all good there. Collect as much as you want. Yeah. Have you been suggesting to your clients once the migration is complete to disable their own property, or you let them run in parallel until the end of July? Let, like, them, July. let them run in parallel because you need to kind of see if, because one thing is you'll find that there is a difference of, uh, of numbers in the metrics, set number of sessions and number of users and so on in Universal versus GA4. If you see that the difference is between five, six percent, that's fine. If you see the difference of twenty percent, there's something wrong 
either in universal or GA4. Can, so this can kind of, most probably is GA4. Uh, so this at least helps you kind of debug and see where any, you know, figure, fix any issues that pop up before uh, the cutoff, and then you'll have like, the data already there. Now, the question that sh should be asked and Google should answer is, will the data go away? Or, like, can we utilize the data from universal analytics? Or, it will, uh, or will it stay there just we can ex ex extract reports or not? It's still, they're still very unclear about how, how this will happen. Okay. We might get a definite answer by next year, July. That's when the 360s enterprise properties will be cut off. So maybe by then we'll have a more solid answer of what happened with the universal analytics data. But for now, it's side by side up until the cutoff, just so that you can have something to fall back on if J4 fails for any reason. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Is there anything you could do proactively for data retention off the UA? Yes. Uh, if you're using the standard one, then I would say if there's reports that you know are being used re regularly, just start export them, uh, exporting those reports, uh, like his historical reports for them. Like in the last month, last two months, last three months, and so on. Saving them in a CSV file or saving them in any uh, cloud hosting, uh, uh, some big query like uh, platform uh, is at least you you have like oh you own this data and you won't it won't be lost when you you eventually is wiped out uh, if you're using enterprise and there's a connection between uh, universal analytics and big query that you can utilize and just export everything for the past uh, 30 no wait 18 months 18 months for, for a year and a half so that's it gives you uh, somewhat year over year, 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 year data that you can uh, look past on and uh, look, look back on and kind of uh, compare. Uh, there are tools that are paid where you can connect to the standard universal analytics and you get similar exports to what you would get from the enterprise one. Uh, it uses the API and just flattens out the tables for you. So there are diff different ways you can you can uh, go about it. The simple. Not the simplest, the most time consuming but cheapest one is you figuring out what reports that are being used and just export historical data from there. All the way back to the beginning, you talked about that churn um, data point. Mm -hmm. Like, what's an example of have you seen like marketing implement to stop or, um, yeah, stop the churn? Stop the churn. Oh, that's... Uh, <laughs> or improve it. Like, if you've seen a high number and they're like, oh, that's bad, what did they do to help that? So, churn is in in inevitable. Uh, no matter how good your marketing campaign is or marketing work is, there will be churn. It's just how big of a percentage. Is it 50% churn? Like, every month is, you're losing 50% and buying you 50% 50, 50, 50 new, us 50 new users? Then that's an issue because that's a waste of marketing dollars. The, the lower the better, but there's no optimal like industry standard, anything above this number. At least I haven't heard of it, I'm not. Uh, what usually I, I've, I've done over the years is basically uh, coupons. Like we, send out, uh, we know that this, this section, uh, based off of some machine learning uh, algorithm we put in, it says, oh, this group might be falling off and churning off. We send them a coupon. And you might see this in, in if you sign up to a lot of, like I do, sign up to a lot of uh, e-commerce websites or SaaS websites, when they notice that you might be canceling, they'd say, oh, next month is on us, or here's 20% off your next jeans, uh, uh, and stuff like that. This is based, based off of like, the recommendations that come from the churn metric, and, or uh, the back-end machine learning models that marketing teams uh, deploy. Based on that too, do you look at like, what people leave in their cart, their the cart and stuff? Yes, that, not, it depends on the, the, the business. I've worked with NGOs that build their donation funnel as an e-commerce site. So adding to cart, like I am add $5 to this cause and $10 to that cause, adding to cart. So there, I collected this information and what is being added to cart and then not checked out. And based off of that, tried to connect if, if they didn't have a login feature. So I would send the, Google client ID to the back end and kind of connect it to someone who donated before. If it does, then I'd be like, I, we saw that you forgot this in your cart. They hated me for this because a lot of, a lot of negative feedback, how did you get my email? But they ended up checking out in the end. 
So this is one way to utilize it. For e-commerce, it depends on if they're logged in, not logged in, and all that. It just gets a bit murky and iffy. Is there a specific nomenclature for the different types of data that you use for parameter types? Uh, yes. The name the naming? The naming uh, Snakes. Yeah. Uh, the recommendation by Google is just use snake case. In Universal, it was camel case, and I think someone changed so that they changed the whole nomenclature. So now we're it's the thing snake case. Yes, it is time. Thanks everyone for pointing it out. Appreciate uh, your patience, and I hope I didn't bore you. Thanks very much.